Good afternoon. My name is James Clearwater. I'm a member of the Wooden Canoe Heritage Association. I believe I joined in 1985 uh, when I was working on my very first wood canoe, which was a 15-foot uh, old town, which I managed to put back together again, restore, using Jay Stelmach's book in one hand and tools in the other. And uh, ever since then, um, it's been a, a passion, a hobby of mine, and I now have uh, at least a dozen or more wood, wood canoes. Um, this particular canoe is a 17-foot uh, uh, Old Town, um, 1903. Okay, the Old Town Canoe Company was founded in 1903, January 23rd, 1903. Um, it, if you're interested, it's not hard to find information about the Old Town Company because there's this nice book written by Susan Odette about the first uh, about Old Town Canoe Company. Um, this is easily you can find this easily. It's, I think it might even still be in print. The build records for the Old Town Canoe Company uh, boats have survived with the exception of the earliest records. Um, the build record for, for Canoe 1617 was built December 9th, 1903. This boat is serial number 1473. And because the company started in January of 03, Serial number 1617 was built in December of 03. This boat obviously was built uh, during uh, 1903, at some point. But the build record for this one has not, has not survived. As time went on, the records are better, and um, most any old town canoe that you find, there will be a build record uh, for it, which will give you the model and the original color and all the other features that it had. The, the build records for only, I think, five companies have survived. Old Town, Carlton Canoe Company, Kennebec Canoe Company, uh, St. Louis, and some from the Willits uh, Canoe Company from out in uh, Washington State. That's it. Um, the Old Town Canoe Company, I said before, was founded in 1903. Uh, prior to that, it was called the Robertson Old Town Canoe Company. And John Robertson, we'll talk about a little bit more with one of the other boats that I'll be bringing out here, um, but we'll leave it at that for a moment. This canoe is uh, what they call an AA grade. There was three, three grades, AA, CS, which stood for Common Sense, and the Guide Series. Um, AA grade boats all had mahogany decks, mahogany seat frames, and mahogany thwarts. And on the later ones, they had mahogany uh, outwales. This boat is a what's called a closed gunnel canoe. The earliest boats prior to 1912 or so were all made in this manner uh, with closed gunnels as opposed to open gunnels, which I'll show you a uh, picture of when we talk about a different boat. But these boats are built um, with the ribs that come up to the gunnel line and they're tapered and they're tucked behind the in whale. And they finished off with a cap on the top and, the, and side caps, which cover the edge of the canvas and the top cap covers the end of the, uh, uh, the, the narrowed end of the rib and the uh, uh, canvas. The seat frames on these early boats are made differently than the later boats. This, this is a seat frame from a canoe from like the 1930s and you can see that it's rounded off on all, this, all sides. This boat, the seat frame is only rounded on the outside, not on the inside edges. It's square. It's almost as if they took a piece of square stock and ran it through shaper and took off just the one side, cut it up into lengths and made the seat frame. The thwarts on the early boats are wider and they're thinner than on the later boats. I'm talking the 1930s. They're a different shape. And the early boats like this one, the the ribs 
are the full width to come all the way up to the gun line. On the later boats, uh, they're, they're tapered. The top six or eight inches is tapered from the full width up to maybe uh, the, about an inch wide at the top. Um, but the early ones are, are the same width all the way up. This early boats prior to 1905, the gunnels protruded forward of the stem, stuck forward in the same manner that uh, EM White canoes or uh, uh, Garish or, or Detroit. They all stuck forward. Later models, after about 1905, they were flush. Okay, so this canoe is a Detroit, Detroit Boat Company. Now, the Detroit Boat Company was built, was in business only for about 10 years, from 1906 to 1916. The Detroit Boat Company only had four models. The Hudson River model, Yukon River model, the Belle Isle Special, and the Tacoma Special. The Tacoma Special only came in 18 foot length. It had sharp upsweep stems and it was only made in limited quantities. The Bell Isle Special was their fancy model with the long mahogany deck. This boat, of course, is the Hudson River model. Now, I, I bought this canoe down in New Jersey a few years ago. I paid $200 for it. Actually, I paid $199 for this little medallion and a dollar for the canoe that was underneath it. Because without this little medallion that identifies it, the canoe is not worth much. It says on it, Detroit Boat Company, manufacturers of high-grade canoes, Detroit, Michigan, and it's got the model on here, Hudson River. And that was mounted here on the deck, on the bow deck. Now, they were, like I said, they were only in business for about 10 years. So this canoe dates from between, you know, around 19, 1910. It had closed gunnels, um, same as that of the uh, old town, and the deck has a very similar deck a profile on the deck that old town was using at the time. And it's oft, these canoes are often confused with old towns because of that feature. It's slightly different. So without the medallion, they are often uh, identified as an old town, which would have been incorrect. The, the, the shape of the thwarts, the shape of the seat frames, um, is, is different. If the, the thwarts are slightly different shape, the, uh, the ribs are rounded off on the edges, not chamfered or left square. And they are tapered when they come up to the gunnel line. Okay, now this, with closed gunnel canoes of this vintage and of this type of construction, the, the ends of the ribs are tapered very thin and nailed from the outside into the into the in whale. Now, the disadvantage of that is pretty obvious that it's, this one reason why it's coming apart is because these ribs tapered so thin are fragile and they have a tendency to rot off. All right, so this is a Detroit 15 that was built by Jack McGreevy in 2005. Now, Jack McGreevy, was a charter member of the Wooden Canoe Heritage Association. He lived and worked up in Cato, New York, which is near Syracuse. Jack uh, built the hull of this boat, and I bought it from him unfinished and, and completed the uh, build. Um, Jack modeled this boat after a Detroit. The stems, the, the, the gunnels protrude forward of the stems, same as the other the original Detroit. Okay, this boat was built uh, with open gunnels as opposed to the originals that were built with closed gunnels. All the Detroits were built with, the original Detroits were built with closed gunnels. Open gunnels has the distinct advantage that when you turn the boat over, all the water will run out through the through this, these slots. And because the, the ribs are the full thickness, it's uh, um, much sturdier and less apt to uh, rot. Most of the canoe companies switched over from the closed gunnel style to this open gunnel style after 1912 and definitely after like 1915. It's easier to build and uh, a stronger 
result. Okay, now we're going to talk about three canoes that have uh, a Charles River uh, relationship. This is a Howard Crandall, and we have a Nutting and an Arnold. Uh, Howard Crandall built this boat in Worcester, Massachusetts, which is a little bit west of, uh, of Boston. He had a boat shop there, and he operated from the late uh, 1800s, sorry, 1898, up through, the, and he died in 1924. His wife and his son kept the business going up through uh, World War II, and when it uh, closed up uh, shortly after World War II. Howard Crandall was the son-in-law of John Robertson. John Robertson had a uh, canoe factory and a boat livery and boat shop on the Charles. Now, uh, John, um, Robertson was also affiliated with the Old Town Canoe Company at the very beginning. The Old Town Canoe Company was originally called Robertson Old Town Canoe Company. And uh, in 1903, the name was changed, Robertson was dropped. Uh, it was just became the Old Town Canoe Company. And Robertson went to the Charles River area near in Boston and set up his own shop there. Howard Crandall married John Robertson's daughter, Mabel, in 1898. Um, so they, they had a, Robertson and Crandall had a close working relationship um, up through uh, you know, Crandall's death in 1924. This boat was probably built by Crandall himself prior to uh, his death, obviously, in, 18, in 1924. Um, it has a serial number you can just barely read, number 368, so it's relatively early on. So I figured the date was probably uh, 1912, around 1915 at the latest. Crandall, along with Robertson, uh, they built closed gunnel canoes, and they always used this three-lobed or W-shaped deck profile. The ribs, full width all the way up. It had, this boat has white cedar ribs and white cedar planking. The seat frames, the thwart, thwarts and the, and the decks are uh, mahogany. Handel also used flag, uh, these little flag sockets, they're brass nickel plated. And the painter rings, the uh, the plate that mounts on the deck itself is rectangular. Old Town and, Ru and uh, Rushton and others used uh, round ones. Uh, but Crandall used these uh, rectangular ones. Crandall also stamped quite frequently his name on the end of the fort. It would say uh, H. H. Crandall, Worcester, Massachusetts. This boat does not have that. Uh, this is the deck on the Crandall. It has a tag that says manufactured by H.E. Crandall, Lake Quiskamong, assuming I'm pronouncing it correctly, Worcester, Massachusetts, with the flag socket, nickel plated brass, and a painter ring with a rectangular uh, base plate. It also has a, a little uh, step in the bottom of the canoe on the, on the stem to receive the bottom of the, uh, of the flag. Uh, this canoe was built by Charles Nutty, N-U-T-T-I-N-G. He had a, a canoe uh, livery and a little factory on the Charles River in Waltham, Massachusetts. He was in business, you know, his obituary says that he was making canoes in 1875, but he would have only been about 19 years old at the time. So if he was in the canoe business, he was probably somebody else's employee. He died in 1941. Um, but prior to World War I and up through the uh, 1920s, uh, he had his canoe factory and livery, and he also ran a dance hall. Um, how much money he made making canoes and how much money he made selling beer and entertaining people with uh, the dance club, I'm not so sure, but uh, he did both in the same building. 
the canoe business was on the on the uh, lower level at the river, and the dance hall was on the, the street level. This particular canoe has long decks, um, typical of the fancy canoes that were used on the Charles. Now, canoeing on the Charles River was a really big deal prior to World War One. Um, there was numerous canoe liveries and canoe manufacturers all on the Charles, and they would rent out canoes on the weekends, and there would be a couple thousand canoes out on the Charles River at any given time on the, at any given weekend on the Charles. The people would rent their canoe with their cushions and the rugs and the seat back, like this one. You could sit here. Put your pillows in here and your girlfriend would lean against it and you get to have your conversations and sit out there on the river and they'd have a band and on a barge and it was a big social thing. Very popular uh, during the uh, prior to World War I and even up into the 1920s to a point. Um, the canoes were real fancy. They had fancy paint jobs, long mahogany decks and uh, all the canoe builders uh, made them. All these builders were uh, right next to each other, within walking distance of each other. And we're talking Bartolo, if I'm pronouncing it right, was the first, uh, one of the first builders. It was Robertson, it was Nutting, like this book. It was uh, Arnold, Waltham, Broadbeck, uh, Uh, no, there were several others, all within walking distance of each other, all serving the, the, canoe, the canoe craze on the Charles River. This canoe is built with closed gunnels, which was typical for the period. The ribs are full width all the way up to the gunnel line. It has very nice and wide uh, mahogany thwarts. Some of the canoes really had much wider thwarts than this, to, almost to the point where you would sit on the thwart rather than having a seat. There was no seats, you had these big wide thwarts. Robertson was quite famous for, for doing that. White cedar ribs, and I believe white cedar um, planking on this boat. And outside stems. Of course, there's an inside stem where the planking is nailed to, but this boat has outside stems also, which is a nice feature. And this boat also, the nutting made the, the uh, gunnels to tube forward of the stem. All right, this is the typical tag that's on a, a nutting uh, canoe. It says C.P. Nutting and Company, Manufacturers, Waltham, Massachusetts. Okay, the, the Charles Nutting had his factory, his boathouse, and his dance hall directly across the river from the Waltham Watch Factory. So. It, I suspect that uh, a lot of the employees from the watch factory would come over to the dance hall after work and on weekends um, for uh, the party. Now, Nutting uh, died in 1941, but the dance hall and the factory uh, was there until 1961. When it, fly, when it uh, burned down. You can still see pilings in the river from where the dance hall and the boathouse uh, was. That part is still visible, but everything else is gone. All right, it's, it's not unusual for Charles River canoe builders to use or for you to find. The stern seat riser is a little short piece of brass tube. This is the nutting canoe and it has one all three of these boats had the, the Crandall, as well as the Nutting and the Arnold. Okay, this canoe is probably an Arnold, also made on the Charles River. Now, Arnold's boathouse and little factory was down the street from the Waltham uh, Watch Factory and across the river from Nutting's uh, uh, factory. It was also right next door to the Waltham uh, boat company and boat delivery. We're not 100% positive that this is an Arnold because it has no tag 
and some features are uh, are Arnold Arnold style, and some are not. This this boat has has tapered ribs, which uh, is uh, not necessarily typical of Arnold. But in any case, it's certainly a Charles River builder. It's a very wide mahogany fort, long mahogany decks, and seat frames. It's also a closed gunnel. The, even though on the, you know, at the moment this, this boat, even though it needs some love, the, the gunnel caps and the side caps are, have gone missing. This boat used to have little brass clips. There were six of them, three on each side for a canopy that went over top of the uh, boat so you can uh, put a uh, bug screen or a cover on it so your girlfriend would uh, not have to sit in the sun. Those clips have gone missing also. So when I work on this boat, I'll have to try to make some or find some somewhere. This boat had, has flag sockets, little diamond shaped, uh, brass, nickel plated flag side. This is one on each end. Outside stems and this boat, the, the stems of the uh, gunnels did not do not stick forward of the stem. They end right here on the on this outside stem. This boat, of course the ribs are white cedar and the planking is probably red cedar. And uh, the decks, seat frames, thwarts are uh, mahogany. You'll notice on this boat that the extreme tumble hull, it really rolls in on the top. More so than uh, a lot of other canoes. It really looks, it gives it a nice look. As well as the torpedo stem. These the ends of the boat stick way out what they, what's called torpedo stems. All right, this canoe is a Morris. It's a Model A. Now the Morris factory uh, burned down in 1919, so every Morris that you find is older than that. Dating Morris canoes is a bit problematic, um, but uh, this one with the serial number that it has, which is serial number 12138 is presumed to be have been built around 1914. This canoe also has what they call a special D-shaped outwales, which you paid extra for. This was an added an option, if you will. It has mahogany seats, mahogany floors, mahogany decks underneath that yellow paint, and a floor rack. This canoe, white cedar ribs, red cedar planking. It's not hard to find information about Morris canoes because Kathy Klaus wrote this nice book called The Morris Canoe. Um, and she's, if you want to learn about Morris, this is where you go. It's got lots of good information in it. This canoe came with a paddle. I'm not sure that it's a Morris paddle or just a paddle of the day. But what's interesting about it it has the uh, guy's initials and it has an Abercrombie and Fitch uh, stamp on it. Back when uh, Abercrombie and Fitch sold real sporting goods, not just overpriced uh, sweatshirts. Morris canoes are unique with this, the, the stem. It has a splayed stem that's much, it's like three inches wide on the bottom of the canoe. And even if it has no tag on it or no name, you can see a canoe with a splayed stem. It's probably a Morris. Now this is a typical stem, splayed stem on a Morris canoe. It's like three inches wide across here. And it has the serial number tag on the stem. Now, with Morris canoes, you can read in Kathy's book, this, this tag was located in different locations as time progressed. On the stem, sometimes it's lengthwise, sometimes it's crosswise, and sometimes it's up on the uh, on the in whale. 
right, this is a photograph that I bought either on Craigslist or eBay, I can't remember. But what's interesting is this is a Morris canoe. You can tell by the, the plum uh, stem and also because the, the deck, which is just visible behind the guy's elbow, is a heart-shaped deck of the type of the Model A, like uh, this yellow canoe here. And you can see it's all fixed up with uh, pillows and a backrest and uh, wearing a tie, all very, uh, lots of fun back in the day. Okay, this canoe is a Rushton Indian girl, uh, canvas covered canoe, uh, about 1910 or thereabouts. It was found by uh, Russ Padden, who's a WCHA member, down in New York City of all places. And uh, I decided, or my wife decided, that we had to have this and I was supposed to fix it up. So, needless to say, it needs a lot of love. There are 45 ribs in this boat, and at least 25 of them are broken, and some of them are massively broken. Now, Rushton was in business from like 18, late 1870s. He died in 1906, and the company folded completely in uh, 1916. Uh, after Rushton died in 1906, the company was incorporated, and um, this boat, because of the serial number, it falls in that period after he died and before the company folded up. So between 1906 and 1916, so figure 1910, thereabouts. A gentleman by the name of Atwood, Atwood Manley wrote this nice book about Rushton and his times in American canoeing. Uh, this was published in 1968. I think it's out of print now, but it's not hard to find copies if you want one. Um, it was published by the Adirondack, Mu Adirondack Museum. and has some really great stuff about Rushton. Rushton's real claim to fame was, was not canvas-covered boats like this. It was the all-wood boats, the, the deck-sailing canoes and the lightweight uh, paddling canoes. The Adirondack Museum actually has a room with several uh, more than several of his boats and he was a very well-known highly respected uh, builder at the time he was uh, one of the uh, charter members of the American Canoe Association the Wooden Canoe Heritage Association published at least one of these catalogs of Russian this is for the Indian girl and it's got you know, some good information this is readily available The Indian Girl was produced from like 1902 on up through the uh, end of uh, the company. This canoe has uh, its closed gunnel, or almost what I would call a double gunnel canoe. The, the ribs are tapered at the top and they're pocketed underneath, unlike the way that Old Town did it in Detroit. These are pocketed. Uh, Morris did it this way too with pocketed ribs. Rushton produced the Indian Girl in a couple grades. The highest grade was uh, made in cherry. This is the outwhale. The outwale, the thwarts, and the decks and the sea frames were made of uh, were made of cherry. And it's a it's a closed gunnel canoe, or what I would call a double gunnel canoe, because the inwale and the outwale is is heavy and thick, unlike uh, like the uh, Old towns would just hit a cap on the top and a cap on the side. These, both the inwale and the outwale are, are heavy. On Rushton Indian Girls, he, the shear strake, the, the top plank on his boats were all wide. This is upwards of eight inches wide. The, the rest of the planks are quote unquote of normal width. But that was, this is a telltale sign of a Rushton. Even if it wasn't labeled and didn't have a tag on it, and it had this big wide shear strake you're pretty well assured that it, uh, it was a Russian or uh, had Rushton uh, pedigree. On Rushton Indian Girls, the bow seat was not hung from the gunnels like on uh, Old Towns and most of the other builders. It was mounted on cleats. This is one of the original cleats. It goes on, on the uh, 
on the ribs here and screwed from the outside in. These are pretty well shot, so I, so I made a new one. This goes in here. The, Ru the Russian seats were quite plain, even though they're cherry, but they're, there's no profile to them. They're just rectangular stock. That's all it is. The, the rear seat, however, was trapezoid shaped. And this would mount from the gunnels, underneath the gunnels. This way. There were two thwarts. This is a new one that I made because it was the original was gone missing. This goes in here. And this one goes back here. This one, it says US trademark registered Indian girl on here. This canoe also has on both stems on the inside, it's marked J.H. Rushton, Canton, New York. And it has a serial number, 3018. But there technically is no build records that have survived, so we're not exactly sure of the date, but it's in between 1906 and 1916. Rushton used these heart-shaped deck on the Indian girls. This is the bow deck. Goes in here. And this is the stern one. I mounted a little block on the back so I could put it in a vise and actually work on it. And it originally would have had a uh, painter ring through this hole here. So I'll have to uh, have to uh, find one or make one to replace in that hole. Needless to say, the in whales are broken. Both sides here. I got to have to scarf. I have to cut this and scarf in new pieces and lengthen them back out. And the ribs, because so many of them are broken, what I'm doing, so I'm using this little nifty tool. This is Steve Lappy's idea, not mine. I, he, he gets all the credit for this. This came from Woodcraft Tool Company. You put it in here, and on the good side, this side of the boat's pretty good, in pretty good shape. That side's all busted. And you tighten it up. And it holds the shape of the, the, the shape of the of the good side of the boat. And, you lay, and I made make these blocks using this as the pattern. This is for number three, which is uh, over here. This one. You cut these blocks like that. Then you can turn it around and put it on this side where the ribs all broke. And using drive screws and fender washers, pull the boat back into shape. Now each one of these is different, of course. That's why you need this nifty tool. So you can make a different one for each rib. And I'll get them mounted in, at least this is the plan. Get them mounted in there and pull the boat in back into reasonable shape. Back into a, a fair, fair shape. And then I can start replacing a couple ribs at a time. Take out the old ribs, take out the block, take out the rib and do a couple ribs at a time in a normal conventional manner of bending it, bending the new rib on the outside of the boat and then putting it on the inside. That's the plan. Hopefully it'll work. The only reason this boat is really worth fixing is because it's a Rushton. If it was almost any other manufacturer with this many broken ribs and this many problems, you would uh, simply drag it over to the burn pile and open up a bag of marshmallows. It's, uh, but because it's a Rushton, it's worthwhile fixing. Okay, this is the, I think the last boat we'll be looking at. This is a 1943 Old Town double-ended boat. It's not a canoe, it's a rowing boat. And Old Town carried this model in their catalog for years and years. It was a favorite of uh, summer camps and rental places and, and fishermen. It's stable, um, carried multiple people in here. 
and uh, there's a real nice, real nice boat. Um, this one I bought a number of years ago, and it uh, it came with a aftermarket sail rig. This is not an old town sail rig. This is a sprit sail, S P R I T, because of this. This is called a sprit, and it holds up the the point. It's a four-sided sail, and then the sprit holds up the uh, the point. Most sail canoes uh, have a lateen sail, a three-sided triangular shaped uh, sail, but this one had a uh, has a sprit sail. Now it was aftermarket; Old Town did not sell it, um, and when I got it, it was missing most of the most of the bits and pieces for the sail rig. It had the mast and it had the rudder and the sail. Uh, not that rudder, a rudder. <laughs> um, the rudder that it came with is actually this one. This was the original rudder. And uh, we were out sailing one day and it twisted right off and broke. So I had to make another one. I made that one. I made the I made the uh, mast partner this piece as well as the lee board bracket and the lee boards. Now this this mast partner is clamped to the gunnel on both sides. And if and if you're trying to set up a boat to sail and you want to use a clamped on rudder, just a word of caution: these things have to be mad tight because if this were to slip off while you're sailing along, all kinds of things would happen real quick, none of them good. Probably break the in whale and uh, it would not be not be pretty. So anyway, these have to be mad tight. Now these uh, tail nuts or lever nuts, Old Town used those on, on uh, the motor mounts, they used them on the removable yokes, and they used them on these uh, on the lee boards and you, you need these things to get it tight the little wing nuts that you get at the hardware store if you use them you can't get them tight enough so you find yourself some of these lever nuts or make them these i got off of ebay i had, i bought a uh, i think i bought two uh, motor mounts just for the hardware because it's difficult to, these are not available commercially anymore same with these the ones I bought for the leeboard bracket. Um, I had to acquire all this stuff because it didn't. The boat didn't come with it. The, the, the double-ended boats came with these nice removable seat backs, so that your uh, your passenger, or at least one of them, could could sit on either end, lean up against the the seat back. Um, when we're when we're out sailing, we don't use these because they're loose. And they'll get lost. The one disadvantage with this boat. Is if you do manage to dump it over, which we did, it's not buoyant enough that it'll, when it's swamped, it'll sit, the gunnels, the gunnels will not be above the water. So you, it's impossible to bail the thing out. So you'll have to get yourself to shore and then, uh, or have some friends um, help, help you uh, rescue you. Unlike more modern sailboats, that are buoyant even when they're swamped. This one is not. Okay, as I said, this is a sprit sail. And this is the sprit that holds the, the point up. And this is held up with this halyard that goes through this loop here. Now this loop, this little short string here, that's called a snotter. Now don't ask me how, why it's called a snotter, I don't know, but it's a crazy name. This actually, Technically, this is a boomed sprit sail because it has a boom on the bottom. A lot of sprit sails were sailed loose footed. They, didn't, they did not have this boom across the bottom. The rudder, the rudder hooks on, I can't put it on because it, we're sitting on the lawn here, but the rudder hooks on in a normal fashion and it's set up for uh, rope steering. Pull and push on, the, on this on the rope, which would be tight, and it uh, moves the rudder back and forth, as opposed to a more modern setup for uh, 
American Canoe Association sailing, they use push-pull sticks. A, a, a stick on either side and you push and pull on it to move the rudder back and forth. But the rope steering is real common with uh, sail canoes. This is called a downhaul. This would be normally tighter. It, it helps keep the bottom of the, the foot of the sail pulled down tight so it doesn't ride up. And of course the lee boards, lee boards would be sticking down into the water and you can raise and lower them um, as needed. Now, one, one uh, nice thing I guess about sailing canoes and even this boat is that uh, because it does not have a center board, it has a lee board coming down the side, everything is adjustable. Now, the bad thing is everything is adjustable. It, it goes both ways. I mean, normally when you would buy a, a commercially produced sailboat, the guy that designed it already figured out where the center board was supposed to be as a, in relation to where the center of effort is on the sail. And that's all set up for you so you don't have to figure it out for yourself. With these lee boards, you have to move them back and forth until the boat sails correctly. After you get it figured out, then you just put it back together every time you want to go sailing in the same spot and you're good to go. Okay, so I guess we're about out of time. Thank you everyone for, for watching. I hope it was informative and uh, entertaining at least a little bit. And so support the WCHA. Paddles up.